Good morning and welcome uh, to another Will's Taco Tuesday. Uh, I'm excited to have you here. My name is Jeff Bruner, for those of you who may not know me. Um, today we have uh, an excellent slate of presenters, all uh, Will's vendor partners. Uh, you can see here on the screen the lineup for today's session. Uh, we're starting off today with ABC Clio. Uh, joining us from ABC Clio will be uh, Paul. So uh, I know that you're eager, everyone's eager to get underway. So I'm going to um, stop sharing my screen uh, to allow Paul to take the reins. Uh, Paul, over to you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and I trust and hope that everybody is seeing um, uh, my page where it says educator support in the upper left-hand corner in October featured resources. Um, Looks good, Paul. Looks good. All right. Well, thank you. And again, uh, thank you everybody for taking time out of your schedules. And, and thank you very much to Wills for hosting this Taco Tuesday. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as Jeff indicated, my name is Paul Webb and I'm a customer success specialist with ABC Clio. And what I'm going to review today is what we refer to here at ABC Clio as our educator support sites. Uh, whether you're a current uh, subscriber uh, to ABC Clio uh, through Wills, or maybe you just uh, have some interest in, in ABC Clio, uh, I think often our subscribers are unaware of the practical resources uh, and instructional tools, curriculum guides, and opportunities for professional learning and development, which are available in the educator support site. If you are a current customer, you do need a, a login for the educator support site. If you don't know what that is, you can always connect with Wills or connect with me and we'll make sure we get that to you, okay? Now, uh, here I am working within uh, the educator support site within our American history collection, but regardless of what collection I'm in, it will, the structure will be very similar. Uh, you will notice as we hit the homepage of the educator support site, we have three essential areas. We have curriculum resources, professional development resources, and some uh, tools and resources to help you introduce the database, uh, for example, to your teaching and or library colleagues. Uh, just real quickly, if I scroll down, you will see that we often provide featured resources by month. Obviously, this is October. Uh, in these uh, featured resources sections, often we will provide links to resources that are in collections that you may or may not be subscribing to. Uh, but if you're not subscribing to them, you will have access to those resources for a full 30 days. We have materials for classrooms, for libraries, for districts, as well as where you can sign up for additional resources. Okay. Now, with the curriculum resources, uh, real quickly, I understand I have about 15 minutes. Uh, the first uh, curriculum resources section, this is sort of what I would like to refer to as your one-stop shop for instructional support. It includes curriculum guides, lesson plans, student activities. Uh, in order to select uh, the, the educator support site for the database, and by the way, as a subscriber, you will just see just the collections you're subscribing to in the drop-down menu. Uh, but if I clicked on this, for example, and go into the American history uh, resources here, curriculum guides and resources, you will notice that you may search by keyword. For example, if you're looking for materials, if you're doing some unit planning, or maybe you want to plan out your syllabus, or maybe you're looking for instructional support for your class, you can search a topic, idea, or subject. You can see that we have a browse by category feature, uh, planning resources, lesson plans, activities for students. And if you scroll down, again, if you're a customer, uh, you can browse by time period. If you're teaching a particular subject area uh, within a collection, uh, you can uh, browse by that time period. These time periods sync up exactly to uh, the, the time periods within the student view of the collections as well. I'm gonna go into, for example, maybe some lesson plans for teachers. Let's just take a look at some of these resources here. And as these load, uh, you have the option to filter by category. If I click on that, you can see the types of resources <clears throat> that are available here in the curriculum section. Uh, we have full curriculum guides, teaching tips, research lists. Research lists are a listing of, of resources within the collections that you can make available for your students. Uh, some of our editors and in-house uh, experts, uh, historians that we work with have put these together. You may also curate and build your own research lists as well. We have ready to use lectures. Uh, along with Google Slides that you may use. Uh, we have a uh, focus on literature series. Uh, I think sometimes folks are not available that we have those types of resources. Often when folks think of ABC Clio, they tend to think of history and social studies. And of course that is where our strength and concentration is. But we also have materials that would be relevant and useful, say for example, for like AP literature classes as well. 
with that focus on literature aspect. We also have a focus on primary sources. If, say, for example, uh, you're working in the library or maybe you are a social studies teacher and you're introducing primary sources to your students, maybe as part of a, an assignment to do a research paper and so forth. Okay. I'm going to go in just real quickly just to show you uh, some of these ready-to-use features. For example, I have uh, uh, a ready-to-use lecture here on the American expansion in the Spanish-American War. Uh, if I select that, this will open up and it will give me sort of context. It will suggest and recommend the grade level. Now, obviously, you, you should always feel welcome in the materials that are available through the educator support site to sort of uh, modify things to suit them to your own purposes, uh, tweak them, cherry pick uh, material out of, the, say, the curriculum guide that you would like to use and emphasize in your classroom instruction. It will give you a focus, a factor, outcomes. There will be writing questions and even, as I indicated, those Google Slides, which you may download and use during your classroom instruction time. It's also here in the, the um, educator support site that we have correlations. For example, if I go into that just real quickly, uh, we have correlations for the Wisconsin state standards. You simply select Wisconsin, select your grade level, and select the section within those standards. And this way you can match up content within your ABC Clio collections to the Wisconsin state standards, okay? So let me go back to the home page here just real quickly. And as that loads in our view, uh, so again, curriculum resources, uh, that's where you'd find instructional support, curriculum guides, lesson plans, student activities. We also have in the professional development section, let's go ahead and click on that and take a look. We have resources here where you can boost your teaching skills and enhance your subject knowledge. Uh, this is a great resource. Perhaps you may be, for example, like an experienced teacher, but maybe you have a brand new prep. Uh, this will help you uh, sort of uh, get some, some uh, enhanced knowledge, get up to speed on that new prep, uh, make that uh, unit planning uh, for your instruction uh, much easier and less time consuming. Uh, we have here in the ideas and perspectives section, and these uh, uh, we update on a regular basis. We have materials related to war and diplomacy identity and equality, as well as economics. For example, if I go into identity and equality, you can see the types of materials that are available here for professional development. Uh, there will be links to videos. There will be links to articles on websites, podcasts. You may sign up for some of our webinars or webinars that we're sponsoring. These are at no cost in terms of signing up for those webinars. And as I scroll down, you can see the types of materials that are available here. Okay, so again, these are primarily related professional development. In the teaching and learning section, we have materials uh, for you related to information literacy, equity and inclusion, as well as research and inquiry. Uh, if I click, for example, into equity and inclusion, uh, you can see that we have materials for teachers, but also for, uh, you know, uh, uh, equity and inclusion issues, not only within the classroom, but also within libraries as well. Just to scroll down again, we, we have lesson plan, thinking about lesson planning, um, as well as additional articles. And again, uh, walking through this rather quickly because I want folks to, to understand and realize that the educator support sites are part of your ABC Clio subscription. Um, and the, obviously there's no additional cost associated with this. They are simply rolled into your subscription. Uh, and as I indicated, you do need what we refer to as an educator login to access these many, many resources that are available for you. And then finally, just looking at the clock, um, we have a section on actually using the ABC Clio uh, database collections. Again, you would simply select the collection you wanted to work with. And again, you would see in your view, if you are a current customer, just the collections that you would be subscribing to. Again, if I go into the American history collection, uh, as an example, you will see that, um, we have an overview video uh, using uh, ABC Clio, the American History Database, uh, high level overview. This is a nice feature, for example, if you're working with students, whether in the classroom or perhaps in the library, and maybe you don't have in that particular moment a lot of time to do an in-depth interaction, you can always make this video available uh, through the link. Um, you know, link that on like, I don't know, through Google Classroom or maybe through your LMS on your library page, classroom page, however you'd like to do that. Uh, and then your students can go through this at their own pace and learn about uh, searching and navigating within uh, the ABC Clio collections. We also have videos on that research list feature. Again, remember, 
Research lists are a grouping of sources, uh, typically by subject area, topic area, that you can make available for your students. They are linked on the home page at the bottom of the page in the student view of the collections. And again, we have compiled literally hundreds of these research lists here at ABC Clio, but you and your colleagues may also compile your own research lists and make them available for your students, whether for a month, for a semester or a quarter, or even for up to a year, depending on your preference. And then finally, here we have uh, uh, a brief video, uh, a slightly more in-depth overview of the educator support site that we are talking about today. This is a great way to introduce the educator support site to your colleagues, for example, or maybe you have a brand new colleague. Uh, you can uh, provide a link to this video. Uh, they can go through it and learn more about the educator support site and the materials that are available here for them. We also have user guides during this section, as well as content indexes for all of our collections. So for example, here in the American History Collection, you can review the content index and see the subject coverage for the whole collection, and then maybe match it up to your unit planning, okay? So again, as I go back to the homepage for the educator support site, uh, I wanna stress and emphasize that the whole the whole rationale, the whole purpose of this educator support site is to um, help facilitate the integration of your ABC Clio collections into your classroom and library instruction. The idea is to make it seamless, make it efficient, uh, and provide you materials uh, to complement your own sort of instructional resource development. Okay. So that's, uh, again, I want to thank everybody for taking time out of your schedule and, and thank Wills again for uh, um, inviting me to participate uh, in this Taco Tuesday. And with that, um, I will uh, stop sharing and turn it back over uh, to uh, the moderator. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Paul. Um, it's always exciting to see uh, a little bit more information on a resource that <clears throat> that I don't get a lot of exposure to uh, personally uh, for most of my time at Wills. I've worked uh, most closely with uh, the academic libraries <clears throat> and we don't have a lot of uh, higher ed uh, members using ABC Clio, but many of our K-12 and, uh, and other libraries do. So it's great to see that. Thanks so much for that insight, Paul. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen again, just to get us uh, prepared for our next uh, presenter. So uh, joining us today uh, from Bio One, I actually have three folks. I'm not sure who all will be speaking, but we have Chelsea, Christine, and Amanda um, all coming to us today from uh, another Wills vendor partner, uh, Bio One. Uh, Bio One folks, are, are you ready to go? Yep, we're all set. I'll share my screen, Jeff. All right, I'm gonna stop my share so we can flip over to you. Awesome, thank you. Great. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's uh, Christine Orr. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Bio One. And as you can hear, uh, Chelsea Tharp, our North American Sales Manager, is with us. And Amanda Rogers, who supports our uh, marketing efforts, is here. So thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for the invitation to organizing this. And we're really happy to be a part of it today. Um, many of you already have Bio One Complete in your collections, while others might be unfamiliar with the resource. So we want to take a little time to reintroduce you to the collection and give you kind of a high level um, review of what we have and what we have to offer here. So with that, let me tell you a little bit about Bio One. We're a unique organization. We were founded by librarians and scientists more than 20 years ago uh, with the goal of providing a financially sustainable alternative to for-profit publishing. We were actually formed at a uh, I think over a couple of uh, beers and drinks at a restaurant and there's a, some cocktail napkin in the Bio One archives that says, well, here's the problem we're trying to solve. So our mission is really to help small and specialized society publishers stay editorially and financially independent while providing libraries an easy and affordable access path to this specialized content in our subject areas of the biological, ecological, and environmental sciences. So easy way to think of it is um, 
plants and animals. That's the kind of, uh, you know, we cover organismal biology and we continue to support both of these communities. We provide um, uh, direct subscription funding back to our community of publishers each year. And over the years, we've provided more than $50 million back to these partners, helping them to stay editorial and financially independent. We also support scientists throughout their careers with um, our ambassador award and some additional services. And we're a mission-driven small team of eight publishing professionals, and we're devoted to sustainable scholarly communications. And with that, I'm gonna have Chelsea tell you a little bit about the collection. Thanks, Christine, and hello, everyone. So how do we do this? We created BioIncomplete, a full text database of 217 titles from 159 different society and independent publishers in the biological, ecological, and environmental sciences. New content is added to the collection daily and new titles are added on an annual basis. So we usually send out our new title announcements around August and September. Um, and in addition to including content from a global community of scientists, BioIncomplete is a high quality collection. 80% of our titles are ranked with JCR impact factors and more than 60% of our subscribed content, our subscribed current content is exclusively available in XML format through our platform. Furthermore, our core subject areas support a wide range of research and academic disciplines, meaning a single subscription to BioIncomplete can benefit many users at your institution. And while Bio and Complete is a subscribed collection of 184 titles, we also host on our platform 33 open access titles from publishers who have determined that OA is a sustainable model for them. Together, these comprise all 217 journals on the platform. Bio and Complete is applicable for students and researchers working in an array of core subject areas, including organismal biology, agriculture, plant sciences, biodiversity conservation, veterinary sciences, zoology, and more. So in addition to Bio One being a collection that is useful across a broad range of disciplines, it's also applicable for users at many levels of study of research and practice. So if you're supporting students, so in addition to obviously the, the research component, um, but if you're supporting students who are preparing for say careers in natural resource management, environmental preservation, veterinary and animal science, agribusiness, the bioeconomy, bio one is content that they will find valuable now and in the future. Um, major employers such as USDA and other government agencies and labs rely upon Bio One. So key employers of some of the specialists that you're training will trust Bio One complete content and rely upon it to help inform their professional activities in the future. And Bio One complete can also be an excellent information resource to support strategic green and sustainability initiatives, we, which we see are really growing across the university and academic landscape. Uh, for example, we noticed that Marquette University is a member of the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education, so the kind of organization that supports kind of broad environmental issues, brings together university leadership, students, and research units. And we're seeing a lot of campuses take to heart, um, you know, uh, embedding the impacts of climate change and environmental concerns in all areas and in many different kinds of curricula. So we're seeing that Bio One is starting to get used in disciplines and areas that we hadn't ordinarily um, seen in the past. So it's becoming much more as, as the environment is uh, you know, uh, of course, on everyone's mind, having this kind of um, this kind of content be uh, appropriate and applicable to broader uh, user bases is something that we're seeing more and more. So while Bio One offers a single unified resource in Bio One Complete, we offer it in a couple of different ways via an annual subscription and now a new one-time archive purchase. So I want to turn it over to Chelsea to tell you more about each option and how it works with Wills. Thanks, Christine. So I'll start with our annual subscription. Um, so subscriptions to Bio and Complete are available to academic institutions, non-academic organizations, corporations, and government agencies. So even through Wills with our current subscribers, we have some academics um, as well as some nonprofits. Um, and I know that there's a large K-12 subscriber or sub membership base rather within Wills um, that we would also find the resource being very applicable for. Um, so the annual subscription is our most popular option as it provides access to all current and backfile content published on Bio Incomplete. 
With the annual subscription, post cancellation access is also included for content published during your active subscription term. Furthermore, buy one follows very flexible licensing terms and policies with no contracts required in order to start your subscription. Libraries are able to begin a subscription at any time and will simply prorate it to align with Will's April 1st renewal cycle if need be. Uh, our pricing is based on a tiered system according to FTE and discounts are available for consortial purchases and multi-year subscriptions in some cases. Uh, even at our maximum rate, BioInComplete's average per active title cost remains under $200, making it 94% less than the commercial average, according to recent library journal uh, surveys. Uh, we offer Wills members an additional 10% discount on the annual subscription. And for anyone who doesn't already have access, free, tri free trials are also available for evaluation purposes. So just let me or Jeff know if anyone's interested in that. Uh, this year, we are also pleased to introduce a new option for accessing BioIncomplete, which is the BioIncomplete archive. It includes permanent access to all subscribed content more than five years old, amounting to more than 135,000 articles from 177 titles. In other words, a critical mass of content covering all of our, all of our subject areas. Organizations who prefer to invest one-time funds rather than an annual spend will find this a great way to get into BioIncomplete and provide your users access to a large library of content. And for our existing subscribers, this is a path to expanding your permanent electronic holdings. We are pleased to offer 5% discount on all archive purchases through Wills. So again, please let me or Jeff know if you're interested in a quote or more information. And we've also set here some contacts and resources. I don't think we'll have time to take everyone through it, but these are great um, to look through. We have our library resources, which are always being updated. We have brand new instructor resources, um, which out, outline different um, popular subjects that can be included in course packs. And we're also working on um, more support documentation through videos um, and other areas of the website. Um, so I think at this point, I'll open up the floor to any questions. Everyone's eating their tacos. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, we don't have anything more, but thank you so much, everyone. Jeff, did you have any questions for us or? Hi, Christine, I'm sorry, my computer like completely fritzed out right when you began. So oh, no. <laughs> no, no the way. session's been running this whole time, but I didn't, I didn't get to hear any of what you said. <laughs> oh, you, you know it all already. But, uh, but thank you very much for, for inviting us. We really appreciate the, the chance to speak with everyone today and the, the uh, broad membership that Wills represents. We really appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Well, it's our pleasure and, and thanks for, uh, for coming. Um, it looks like we still have a few minutes, so if anyone's got uh, questions or anything that you'd like to uh, ask our Bio One friends, please do. I, I think our next presenter might not be in the session quite yet, but hopefully it'll be here uh, pretty soon. We're running a little bit ahead of schedule. Well, I can tell you we're um, excited. As, as Chelsea mentioned, we add a couple of new titles each year. We're very judicious in what we do add to the collection because we want to keep pricing nice and even for everyone. We're so excited. We've just announced that we're adding two new entomology titles to the collection, and they're both having to do with dragonflies, which is really exciting. So we have a, a very heavy subject collection, uh, heavy subject concentration in entomology. Uh, with many, many ISI ranked titles there. And so it's a really nice interplay between uh, the entomology and the agriculture titles. So we're excited to have those. And um, some of our other titles, which are really interesting as well, we do a lot in um, avian research and ornithology is quite strong for us. We have titles from the American Ornitholo Ornithology Society, Raptor Research Society. Everyone loves a raptor, that's very cool. And we also have a lot of um, plant sciences and agriculture titles. Um, things from um, New York Botanical Garden, Canadian Science Publishers, CSIRO and others. So we really invite you to take a broad look at the collection and see the kind of content that is, that is appropriate for your user base.
We have a title just on bears too, very cool, called Ursus. So I have to say, it's really uh, exciting to navigate the collection and see the different kinds of specialty content that is available. And it, the Bio One collection makes a nice complement to some more broad resources. So if you're doing specialized research, it's really an excellent complement to those other to those other resources. So it really can um, add personality to your biology and environmental sciences collection. That's really good I, and very exciting. I, uh, <laughs> I actually uh, was just thinking like, I know they've got so many um, uh, different animals represented in the uh, various collections. And um, I actually had just been wondering about bears. So it's funny that you mentioned that. Kind of yes, Ursus, all little. about bears from the International <laughs> Bear Research Society. We also have, a we also do, there's an awful lot of geology and paleontology. Um, species research, you know, um, species discovery and taxonomy in there as well. And um, a lot of plant sciences as well. I just noticed one of our titles that I always kind of take a look at is um, the Tree Ring Research Society <laughs> Journal, which is super specialized, but it's like, you know, you know how the, the you know, glacial scientists will take ice cores. This is the land version of ice cores is looking at, you know, the tree rings and seeing what kind of, um, you know, the history of climate science and environmental impacts over over generations. And so it's uh, really an excellent compliment. Um, very cool stuff. So that's really, that is really cool. I'm always fascinated by uh, how much we can learn about truly ancient epochs mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, by looking at, uh, at like the the growth rate of rings during different years, so that's that's oh, really and it's so relevant today to all of the climate research. It seems like it's just old timey stuff, but it is incredibly impactful for um, how our climate scientists are operating today, and it gives them great historical context for the research they're doing. So. That makes great sense. Well, thank you again uh, to everybody from Bio One for joining us today and uh, and uh, showing us uh, some of the cool things that you have to offer in the collection. Um, I, 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 as I said, I f unfortunately missed most of it because of my computer, but in case you didn't say it, I will say uh, anyone who's interested in learning more about um, Bio One, uh, please do feel free to reach out to, to me, uh, Jeff Bruner, or to the folks uh, here joining us from Bio One today. All right, with that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to flip back again to sharing my screen, maybe. Mm. All right, <laughs> my computer's being a little bit odd again today or right now, so I might not be able to do that if you can even hear me. Um, and Andrew's freaking out again. Oh, I see that you can hear hear me. All right. So a couple of technical things happening here today. I'm not quite sure what's going on with that, but I think I might have us have myself back on track. So uh, here we are back at our um, uh, kind of schedule for today's session. And it gives me great pleasure to uh, introduce uh, joining us from JSTOR, uh, Kevin Ocampo. Uh, Kevin, um, can you, uh, are you you with us? I am here, Jeff. I'm here. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that um, Kevin can take the reins to talk to us a little bit about JSTOR and, and our new relationship with them. Uh, Kevin, uh, over to you. Thank you. And thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Wills, for inviting me today to Taco Tuesday, which I think is a, a genius uh, of a name to, to name a webinar. And I wanted to take the time to review the Ithic, re review the brand, the Ithaca brand, as well as introduce it to um, new new members that are new to JSTOR Ithaca, as well as a, a refresher to those existing partnerships. And if, at Ithaca, uh, we are a nonprofit organization uh, that helps the academic community use digital technologies to, pervert, uh, to preserve uh, the scholarly record and advanced research and 
teaching in a real sustainable in sustainable ways. And we do this through three innovative services that aid in the adoption of uh, these technologies and create and hope create a, a lasting impact. Uh, these three services are JSTOR and ArtStore, Portico, and Ithaca SNR. And, and I'm gonna really focus today on the two brands of JSTOR and ArtStore. Uh, the JSTOR history was created in 1995 to really help libraries address uh, cost issues and, and save on self, self shelf space. Uh, this really helped libraries to uh, repurpose their space, share the cost of digital storage and preservation, and really spread access for, for our users. Uh, since our launch in, in 1997, we, we've continued to expand the platform, adding current journals, books, and primary sources, along with a new service of uh, ArtStore onto the JSTOR platform. So where are we today? Uh, more than 10,000 libraries from 170 plus countries currently provide access to, to JSTOR. And we're, we're really constantly adding content to the JSTOR platform and more than 79 million pages of, of journal content are now available and, and preserved. Our archive journals, uh, like I mentioned, uh, they, cover, uh, they cover across the humanities, social sciences and sciences, and all are hosted on the JSTOR uh, plat teaching platform. Our archive journals are, are really essential, re are, are essential research. Uh, more than 27 scholarly journals, um, more than 2,700 scholarly journals are, are available, and we have more than 10,000 institutions worldwide that, that participate in JSTOR. Our journal archives are multidisciplinary collections, which include our arts and science one through 15, our life sciences. Our journals are also discipline specific collections like our health and general sciences, biology sciences and ecology and botany, as well as business business and economics. So what, what's included in your journal subscriptions? Uh, all issues from volume one and issue one are provided for every journal subscription. Uh, there is a moving wall between three to five years, but some publishers may elect walls anywhere from zero to, to 10 years. Uh, we are really proud to make these fees affordable. And since 1997, we, we haven't increased our fees since then. Even though we, we are, even though we are adding to our collection, we haven't increased our fees. So we have two types of fees. We have a archive capital fee, which is our, a one-time fee per collection, which is invoiced when access starts. And then we have our annual access fee, which is a recurring fee invoice on a, a calendar year basis. And again, the, a, a, the archive capital fee really ensures that JSTOR makes the, any necessary changes to our platform to ensure access and a great user experience. So who do we serve? Uh, who, do, who does JSTOR serve? So we serve along with the higher higher education and academic, we serve museums, government and nonprofits, community colleges, secondary schools, which is your K through 12, as well as public libraries and for-profit academics. And I, I wanted to talk about a, our art store 2021 and beyond. Uh, our store is our image database with three three over three million images, which is now being integrated onto the JSTOR platform. So we are doing this because we, we had a, a platform vision of really having one platform for our journals, books, primary sources, and, and images, further enhancing researchers and 
student's experience onto the J, on, on the JSTOR platform. And with the new, uh, with the integration of ArtStore onto the JSTOR platform, uh, we were proactive and we reduced pricing and which some communities may see up to a 30% savings from their, their previous art store pricing. Uh, while existing members are going to see this reduced cost uh, phased in, in a three year span. So with this new Wills and JSTOR partnership, uh, we have special pricing for new license subscriptions to JSTOR and art store. And we also have trial periods for those schools that are interested. Uh, we have a two month trial period for JSTOR as well as a 90 day evaluation for art store. And also with that, um, existing members may have received an email that we are extending expanded access until June, 2022 for um, our existing partnerships. So last year during COVID, we realized that there was a, a uh, last year uh, during COVID, we provided expanded access to our existing partnerships. So for those participants that subscribe to JSTOR, we provided access to those collections that they didn't license at that, at that time. So we've, expen we've extended that until June of 2022. Uh, with that, schools that are interested in participating in JSTOR can subscribe to one collection and then benefit from the expended access through June of 22. This way, you can really get to understand and use the platform for for two to three semesters, and then we'll be able to provide you with the data on how if the uses data that you may need to see if you are interested in any other collection besides the collection you participate in and subscribe to. Um, so I left 10, five minutes to see if anyone has any questions. Kevin, we've been keeping an eye on the um, chat window and the Q&A module. I don't see uh, any uh, new questions having come in uh, yet while you've been um, chatting with us, but I will encourage those in attendance to feel free to uh, jump in and, and put any questions or, or input that you might have into the chat window and we'll make sure that Kevin sees it so that he can address it. Um, we've, uh, Kevin, of course, if you have uh, more that you want to cover, you definitely should. Um, but I wanted to uh, mention, I think I've, I've said this, uh, versions of this a few times, um, but Wills is really very excited to be uh, partnering up with um, uh, with Ithaca for, for JSTOR uh, because that's something that um, that we've been, uh, a, a relationship we've been trying to get off the ground for many years. So uh, it's a it's very exciting day. Um, my colleague, Andy, who some of you will see in the attendee list as well, uh, she and I visited a JSTOR booth at ALA like eight <laughs> years ago. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> when, when we first started. So we're, yeah. we're excited that we're, we're, we're finally able to kind of uh, uh, shake hands and, and, and move forward in partnership. So that's really cool. No, yeah. I mean, when I, when I mentioned to the outreach team, they were really excited about this partnership. Again, you mentioned that uh, this is... Uh, this has taken a long time to happen, and we're really excited of, of the partnership and Wills of the partnership with Wills, and we really hope to um, we really hope to that that this partnership really help providing access to your members to to JSTOR as well as ArtStore. Well, uh, I, I couldn't agree more. So um, thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for joining us today. Um, I, it doesn't. Uh, oh, look, we've oh, got here's the first um, question. Yeah, go right ahead. If you want to field that, go for it, Kevin. Yeah, 
So Nancy, we are a Jstor subscriber, but not a Jstor subscriber. Can we subscribe to some Jstor and have access to more until June 2022? Uh, yes, to answer, uh, to answer your question, Nancy, yes. Uh, if you do subscribe to at least one Jstor collection, you will have access to all of JSTOR's archive as well as primary collections until June of 2022. And so Kevin, um, you know, if Nancy wants to take advantage of that, um, maybe she should, should reach out to us and, and we, yes. can, uh, we can put her in touch with you and, and put, figure out what pricing will be and how that all works, yeah. right? Absolutely, absolutely, Jeff. Okay, great. And I guess that's true for everyone watching this. <laughs> uh, do, do reach out to us if you've got, uh, if, you, if there's a particular collection you're looking at or if there's something that you want to uh, explore, we're happy to facilitate that and get pricing and, and access uh, running for you through, through our new Wills partnership. Yeah, and, and any of your members who are interested in receiving any type of data like turnaways and, and usage, we can provide you with that as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, you know, Kevin, something that we talked about uh, in, in our meetings um, was the fact that uh, uh, naturally um, many Wills members already do have some JSTOR collections uh, because, it, you know, uh, there's such a, a valuable suite of resources resources. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that if you are a current uh, JSTOR subscriber, um, you know, the, the new pricing that's coming uh, through the Wills deal is for, uh, is meant for new subscriptions, but your existing subscriptions can still come into a kind of under the Wills um, heading. Uh, they, they wouldn't see a, a price change on those, but uh, that it's still uh, all the other benefits that go along with uh, having your renewals available in the My Wills interface and, and the other things that come along with uh, running subscriptions through Wills are, are also possible even for existing subscriptions. That's that's right, right, Kevin? I'm not lying. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you're not right. no, that's absolutely, again, we, we, we do see the value what Wills brings to their members. And yes, absolutely, Jeff, if you, if you are an existing uh, JSTOR subscriber, you, we, we do, you do have the ability to transfer those subscriptions over to the Wills um, license and keeping it all under, under one agreement. Fantastic. Okay. Um, well, I think uh, right now uh, we're basically we're pretty much right at time yeah. to to flip over. So thank you again, Kevin, uh, for joining us today. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Wills, for having me. And I am going to eat some tacos right now. <laughs> Great. <laughs> uh, before before you go, um, sure. I think what, the last thing we need you to do is uh, I think there should be a, a little red button that says stop sharing. If you can do that. Uh, Fantastic. All right. Enjoy your tacos, Kevin. Thanks for joining us right. today. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take us back to uh, our uh, little kind of landing screen here in order to uh, introduce our next uh, and final presenter for today's Taco Tuesday session. We have Paula uh, joining us from Canopy. Speaking of new partnerships with uh, with uh, vendors that we've been hoping to partner with for a long time, Canopy falls into that category as well. Um, and so I'd like to uh, turn things over to Paula. Paula, can you, uh, are you ready to go? I sure am. How are you today? Very well, very well. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I've stopped my screen. Oh, I see Paula has started her. So I'm going to mute myself and turn it over to you, Paula. <sighs> I try. I'm I'm doing my best to make sure that uh, that you all can see me and hear me clearly. And thank you uh, again, Jeff, for inviting me here today to speak to Will's members. It's it's a great opportunity, and we appreciate it very very much. I'm going to go ahead and um, just go ahead and get started with the slideshow. Um, I've got a pop up here. Let's see. There we go. and just talk a little bit about Canopy. Can you all see my screen okay? Yes, it looks good, Paula. Okay, perfect. Um, just a little bit of background. Canopy has been in existence for, oh gosh, about nine years or so. And it started as a collection of videos that were really targeted toward the academic market. 
Uh, professors were um, assigning films for students to watch. And it actually, the, the service started in Australia and they were having a hard time finding one single place to find the films that they wanted to show their students. So our, um, the, the woman who created the program started, um, like I said, in Australia, she partnered with several uh, publishing firms, uh, content partners, and created Canopy. And it was in the academic market predominantly until about four years ago um, when we launched into the public library market. And so between then and now, we have added a lot more popular content. I know that Canopy is somewhat known as, uh, you know, for documentaries and maybe classic films and Academy Award winners, art house films, things like that. And we still do very much have that type of content, but we have expanded quite a bit, even in the last year. So if you have not seen Canopy at this point, um, even in the last year, this is, a lot of this might be new to you. So as for content at a glance, we have over 27,000 films and television shows available, available on Canopy with over 500 content partners. And some of those key content partners are the ones that you see here. Um, Warner Brothers, Lionsgate, MGM, the Criterion Collection, Jim Henson just, Henson just came on board, Samuel Goldwyn Films, Paramount, and many, many more. Um, so we are expanding and we're adding between 50 to 150 new films every single month. So there is something listed for everyone. In terms of kids, we have Canopy Kids. Canopy Kids is a and it kind of an environment or a universe onto itself inside of Canopy. And it's around 1600 or so films and television shows from the likes of PBS Kids, Weston Woods, Sesame Street and Highlights. And it's just a wonderful collection that's really targeted toward children from roughly ages, I would say two to eight predominantly. And then we also have our Canopy series and lots of television that we have added in the last few years. Um, I would say A&E and History Channel are our two newest, but we also have PBS and Lifetime, the great courses I will go over in a moment. Um, but everything from Alone, which is one of our most popular series, to the Historical Roots series, television series, again, have something for for just about every taste out there um, and including the great courses. We do have all of the great courses videos that are available to public libraries in one of the more affordable uh, means of, of seeing the great courses. We also, um, and, and this happened during COVID and it became so popular that we decided to keep moving forward with it. We offer free monthly films on us, meaning um, between eight and 10 films are offered on a monthly basis, and they are both free to the patron in that it doesn't use, they don't use any of their credits that they're offered, and they're also free to the library. So there's always eight to 10 films that are free to use if a patron runs out of credits, or if a library wants to create a, a program and have lots of people watch a film, one of these free, free films might be really useful. Now, as far as enjoying Canopy, you can, as a patron, you can access um, from www.canopy.com and create an account there. Obviously, if you have the Canopy service, we create your own URL that's available to patrons on your website so that patrons can watch on their laptop or desktop. But most most Canopy viewers are watching on television, and the Canopy app is available on the following, Apple TV, Roku, Chromecast, Samsung, Fire TV, and Android TV. If your patrons would like to watch on a phone, tablet, or mobile device, the Canopy app is available on the following, iPhone, iPad, Android, and Fire tablet. So there's definitely lots of different ways to watch Canopy, and Actually, you can um, create an account from any of these apps as well. So we, we want to make it easy for patrons to create an account as well as stream and watch their videos. 
<coughs> excuse me. So I'm going to go ahead and open up the interface. Now, this is the patron interface. This is actually my interface. I'm, I'm based out of Orlando, Florida. And this is my personal account from Orange County Library System here in Orlando. So the first thing that you see is this homepage. And the homepage has roughly 40 shelves, what we call shelves, on the first page. And they change on roughly a weekly basis. So you'll see that the headers for each of these shelves changes based on, um, you know, interests at the time, what what new films that we have that have have been launched onto the onto the platform and so as a patron i can just kind of scroll through here to find what i want um, if i don't want to do that i can also hover over the browse and the drop down menu and see all of the genres and subgenres that we have listed everything from the arts to films to media and communication sciences business but I would say predominantly our, our, our interface is used for movies and documentaries. On the upper right hand corner here is where the patron sees how many credits that they have left to, to watch films. And the way that it works is for most of the collection, um, if I check out a film like Weathering Heights, it's a $2 charge to the library. It uses one credit from the patron's accounts and then the patron has 72 hours to watch that film, okay? We do have new premium content though from MGM and Warner Brothers. It's about 350 to 400 films out of the 27,000 that we offer. So in that case, if I wanna watch Inherent Vice, um, it's a $4 charge to the library, one credit is removed from a patron's account and they have 48 hours to watch that film. There will be an update to this interface within the next month that will um, more easily show a patron how much time that they have left with a film. So um, that is definitely coming. Um, I do want to make mention, so say I'm interested in Dial M for Murder. This pops up. If I press play and expand it to full screen, the movie's checked out to me in five seconds and one credit is removed from my account. There's also um, the ability to add to kind of like a to-do list, add it to my list to watch for later viewing. And we do have trailers on about 65% of our films. There's also more information down here, including letting you know with this little box, any of the films with this little box of PPR means that there's public performance rights included with this film and you can create programming around it. Okay, so that is, that is how you watch a film. Now, for example, um, for a and &E and History Channel content, so say, for example, I would like to watch Alone. I've heard lots about it. Um, Alone and other series in a and &E and the History Channel work like this. Click to say season one. That's where I want to start. Once I click on that first episode, it's a $2 charge to the library. One credit is removed from the patron's account. And you can, and as, as a patron, you can stream and watch all of the episodes inside of that season for a $2 charge to the library. So your cost per play goes way down um, when folks use uh, these particular types of series, which is, is really nice. Now, if I'm looking for the great courses, go ahead and open that up. The great courses works a little bit differently. Like I mentioned before, we have all the great courses that are available to the library market. market. And if a patron is interested in the Renaissance, they click here. Once they play episode one, that's a $5 charge to the library and the patron has 30 rolling days to watch all 48 episodes inside of this um, inside of this course. So they can watch these episodes as many times as they want to during those 30 days for that $5 charge. So again, your cost per play um, actually goes down the more that your patrons watch the episodes. If they move on to another, uh, if they move on to another course, then the same thing happens. It's a $5 charge to the library and they have 30 rolling days to watch all of the episodes inside. Now you can cap the great courses as well by patron. 
um, allow them, you know, one, two or three a month if you like to cap it, but a lot of libraries don't. Um, in Canopy Kids, which I mentioned before, is its own universe inside of Canopy. Um, Canopy Kids also works a little bit differently. And because children, obviously, uh, you know, children watch videos a little bit differently than, than, than grown-ups do. Um, first of all, I want to make mention that if you're a parent, you can set parental controls for Canopy Kids and enter a four-digit code so that your, your child can't get out into the main collection. But the way that this works is, say I'm interested in Elmo Finds a Baby Bird. So if I click on this or my child clicks on this, it signals a $5 charge to the library, no credits are removed from my account as the parent, and my child has 30 days to watch everything, all the films, all the television shows, as many times as they want to during that 30-day period. Okay, so it's, it's really, again, this one is another really good cost per play that the more children use it, the, the better it is. And for each patron, it is self-limited at one checkout a month. It does look like I have um, a question. Here's the first one. Did I hear that correctly? If a patron picks an episode, they get to watch as many of the episodes for one checkout. Yes, for A&E and History Channel content, like Alone, that's why um, I was showing the Alone, uh, series, the this if it, it's per season. So if I check out if I check out episode one, season one, I have seventy two hours to watch all of the episodes inside of season one for that one checkout. Okay, and that again seventy two hours. I hope I I answered your your question there. Um, it looks like there's another one. How long do patrons have to finish a TV series season once they start the first episode? Yes, that would be 72 hours. They have 72 hours. So thank you for the, for the questions there. Okay, now I'm going to go back out to my PowerPoint. I've got two more slides and then we can go from there. So again, as far as the, let's see. No, nope, we don't want that. There we go. As far as breaking down the costs per play, this is a nice kind of overview about how the costs are, are tallied as far as the pay per use model. Um, and I will definitely share this presentation so that you'll, you'll be able to, to see it and refer to it. And in addition, we have a lot of wonderful marketing um, opportunities for uh, marketing uh, canopy to your patrons. We have posters, bookmarks, social media posts, lots of widgets, but really the, the headliner for this is our Marketing Academy Guide. And you can download it and it has lots of different links um, that, you, that you can use both for Canopy and for your other digital resources. So I think I took it right here to the, to the last minute, Jeff, and I think I am Complete, uh, although it looks like there's one additional question. Can an extra step be put on to avoid accidental checkouts? E.g., do you want to check out this title? Um, the way that we work that is that usually is not a problem. If, if there is a problem with a patron that checkouts just, you know, kind of keep happening, all you would have to do, um, and it looks like it's excessive, is, is call the Canopy Help Desk or reach out to me and we take that on a case by case basis. Luckily, we don't have a lot of that problem. But thank you for um, the time today to be able to talk about Canopy. And if you wanna get in touch and have any questions for me or need anything, um, you can reach me at paula.roman at canopy.com. Thank you, Paula, so much for joining us. And thank you to all of our presenters today uh, for making this another really great, uh, successful Taco Tuesday session, despite my own uh, computer uh, crash in the middle of it. Uh, uh, everything seems like it's gone pretty well for everybody else. <laughs> so thank you again, everybody, for being here. Um, I will... Uh, 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 re kind of repeat my my usual uh, wrap up 
for these sessions. Um, again, thank you for attending and uh, keep an eye out for announcement and um, registration links for our next Taco Tuesday session, which will be happening uh, in November on November 2nd. Uh, and also, if you missed any part of this or you want to share it with your colleagues, uh, if you're in the live session, we should have a, a the recording ready to share out uh, probably tomorrow. I would think by the end of Wednesday, we should be uh, sharing out a link to the recording of this session. If you are watching the recording, then I say greetings from the past. Uh, all right, I, I can't help myself uh, with that joke. So thank you everyone for attending and I hope everyone has a great rest of your day.